I think as far as a biography goes, it's a masterpiece. It's quite a fascinating life that Steve Jobs packed into his 58 years. Steve Jobs was a perfectionist and he was a visionary, but he was not in the game to win popularity contests. I remember thinking the day that Jobs died, I was like, well, thank God we've got this book coming out. If I'll just be able to go and kind of immerse myself in the story of his life, and that'll, that'll be this weird way of kind of saying goodbye to him. When somebody is such a phenomenon, when somebody has such an impact on the world, you're really interested on, well, how did that come to be? It's like an origin story in a comic book. I learned a lot about him that I don't think was ever known before. I think a lot of people were really surprised by Isaacson's book. The book for me was definitely a lesson of the price you have to pay to have, um, to have a, a life that's this impactful. It's a warts and all sort of profile. He was a real individualist that lived his life a certain way. And um, a lot of people didn't like him. A lot of people didn't like him. Steve had that kind of street hustler's ability to read someone's vulnerabilities like that. He could look at you and know what you were afraid of, which is why I was personally terrified of Steve. Steve called me in 2004 and I had done a biography of Ben Franklin, was about to publish one on Einstein. He said, why not do me next? I didn't realize he was sick and so I didn't really turn him down. I just said, yeah, let's do it, but let's wait 20 or 30 years till you retire. And then his wife said to me and other people said to me, hey, if you're going to do Steve, you got to do him now. I hadn't done a lot of reading about Steve Jobs. I knew he was the guy behind Apple. I really didn't know very much about his story at all. So I found the book really engrossing. I spent four years documenting Steve, originally for Life magazine. So the book for me was a way to re-examine my own relationship with Steve and what happened back then. The material is beautifully laid out and very well written. Isaacson's a great writer. It's not a book that has a grand theory about jobs. It really just focuses on the incredibly interesting details of his life. It's extremely surprising that this book was written because Jobs was a control freak and wants everything to go through him. And then suddenly he's allowing Isaacson this incredible access to everyone around him. Steve said he wanted an honest book. He said, I've always been honest to people. When they do things that are bad, I tell them it's bad. I want you to write an honest book. If I had to take a guess, I don't think there was any, any question that Walter forgot to ask him. And this dialogue continued up until the time that Steve was too sick to talk. So it was all there. I started my career at IBM in 1976, and Steve Jobs started in the garage in 1976. At IBM, we were very fascinated by what he was doing and kind of put our nose, you know, up. We thought he's some hippie working in the garage and IBM really has nothing to worry about. Before Apple came along, the computer was just this big kind of monolithic mainframe inhuman kind of machine. And everything that Apple did or all their great successes had this incredibly human, playful kind of quality. Steve's all about this sort of zen approach to simplicity and and winnowing away what doesn't work to get to the beauty and the perfection. I mean, he really had a vision of the way technology should look. You know, he just made a very sexy box. He was a strange dude, and he did not lead a conventional life. Sometimes genius has to come from some distortion of how you see the world. I mean, he did create his own reality. For Steve to be a tastemaker, I think he had to be incredibly opinionated and judgmental, and he gave his own inner opinions and judgments a higher weight. <laughs> I very rarely saw the angry side of him, but once when he saw the proposed cover for the book, I got off the plane and there were like seven missed phone calls from Steve Jobs. You know, he started yelling at me about how ugly the cover was. And he said, I'm only gonna keep cooperating if you let me have some say over the cover. Jobs is someone I've kind of always admired, so I was kind of inclined to see all these good things, but man, you read some of these stories and he just was, you know, it's, he's, he was just kind of crazier than I had fully grasped until I read the book. I found that really hard to read about. It was a catalog of bad behavior, really. You know, yelled at this person, screamed at that person, threw a tantrum about this, threw a tantrum about that. He was tone deaf in so many ways. It's like he wouldn't let any sleeping dog lie. When he came down with pancreatic cancer, it was the same blind spot operating. I think I know what's best and no one will convince me otherwise. He had his own ideas about everything. 
And, you know, possibly he could have lived longer, too, if he went to a more conventional treatment instead of trying to think he knew a better way to cure himself. I think he probably regretted that, but who knows whether the cancer would or would not have spread if he had operated on a few months earlier. Walter's real question is, can you really succeed on the highest level and still be a nice guy? Did his accomplishments require him to be a jerk? Um, this is a sort of $64 million question. I don't think there's any easy answer to that. He just pushed and pushed and pushed to perfection. And without that personality trait, I'm not so sure he would have gotten the results. I talked to Steve Wozniak, who said, you know, if I had run Apple, I would have wanted to be run more like a family. We were nicer to everybody. But then Woz paused and he said, but if I had run Apple, we wouldn't have made the Macintosh. There are no shortage of people in all walks of life who are very successful, who are very demanding and have a lot of rough edges to them. I think that um, there are other people that manage to do it without those rough edges. I'm not sure it's necessary. It seems pretty clear he became less of a tyrant as he got older and he became far more successful as he got older. We all know thousands of jerks, but most of them aren't geniuses. So I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just a story about a guy who was intense, but here's how he channeled the intensity to be so ingenious in what he invented. I think he leaves a legacy in many areas. The idea that Steve Jobs bridged art and technology has made him an artist. I think Steve's like Edison or Walt Disney, people who were great at being inventive, but also applying that inventiveness to real products. Probably he'll be remembered more like Henry Ford somebody who brought existing technology to uh, a new level. Steve was all about making the thing better. I mean, how much did your phone suck before the iPhone? He's literally taken us into the future in quantum leaps in ways that allowed us to really have the kind of life that we would have a hard time imagining 20, 30 years ago. Even though his accomplishments were extraordinary, the price he paid, I think, is beyond the pale. He's so complicated and so layered that I think the legacy is only beginning to unfold. <laughs>